Hello, everybody who's watching, everyone who's here now, and welcome to our special pre Shabbat inspiration for Vayera, the Sedra, which opens with the famous scene of Abraham's vision of the three angels. And despite the fact that Abraham was recently circumcised, he builds up the energy to enthusiastically extend his hospitality to the angels who appear to him in human form. And the angels reveal to Abraham and Sarah that, or to Abraham rather, that Sarah is going to soon give birth to a son. After this, Hashem reveals to Abraham that he is to bring destruction on the city of Sodom because of the evil conduct of the people who live there. And in another famous scene, Abraham debates with God on behalf of the people, and he tries to change the, the divine verdict. But there are too few righteous people in these cities to merit a change in judgment. Two angels then proceed to Sodom to meet Lot, who is living there. Lot had inherited the characteristic of hospitality from Abraham, so he invites the angels back to his home. And shortly after the angels come to the home, the evil people of Sodom come to the house. They wish to harm the angels. And Lot does a very strange thing. He risks his safety to protect and defend the angels from harm. But in doing so, he suggests to these evil men that they harm his own children instead. And at the crack of dawn, the angels persuade Lot and his daughters to flee with the, uh, that he should flee with his wife and his two daughters. The angel instructs Lot to flee to a particular mountain. Lot does not want to go there, and he requests that he should be allowed to flee to one of the cities, and that request is granted. The Sedra carries on with Lot running away with his daughters. His wife becomes a pillar of salt when she looks back at the destruction, and the daughters cause their father to get drunk, and the older one has relations with him. And on the following night, the same thing happens with the younger daughter, and both daughters conceive. The Sedra then shifts its focus and discusses the activities of Avraham and Sarah. Avraham and Sarah journey to Gerar, where Avraham informs the people that Sarah is his sister. And the king of Gerar, Abimelech, Abimelech, takes Sarah. But God appears to Abimelech in a dream and tells him that he's, got a, he's going to die because of his actions. God also informs him that Sarah is a married woman. And Avimelech then confronts Abraham and asks him, why did you say that Sarah was your sister? And Abraham replies that if people had known that Sarah was my wife, they may have killed me. And he also explains that Sarah is in fact his half-sister. Avimelech then gives flocks and cattle to Abraham and Sarah in order that Abraham will pray for him because he and his household have become ill. And Abraham prays for them and they are cured. The Torah then tells us that Sarah gives birth to a son. They call him Yitzchak, and Abraham gives him a circumcision when he's eight days old. But then Sarah sees some inappropriate behavior from the maidservant Hagar, and she tells Abraham to send her away. And Abraham is very reluctant to send away Hagar and Yishmael, but God tells him to obey his wife. He assures him that just as Yitzchak will be the founder of a great nation, so too will Yishmael. So Hagar goes out into the desert with Yishmael, and they run out of water, and Hagar fears for Yishmael's life, but God assures her that she has nothing to fear. She sees a well of water, and so she's able to say, save her son. And the Torah relates that Abraham makes an alliance with Avimelech before the Torah then goes on to tell us about one of the most famous incidents in the Bible. That's the command that God gives to Abraham to offer up his son. And in this well-known story, Abraham demonstrates his commitment to God by taking his son, but the angel of God stops him at the last moment. Abraham has already proven his commitment. God does not want him to offer his son, and Abraham offers a ram instead. That is our action-packed parasha. It's going to stop to let some people into the room and just share a couple of inspirational ideas today. So one thing is the remarkable way in which Abraham treats the three angels. Generally, it's understood by our commentaries that he doesn't know that they're angels. They appear as uh, as regular people. Right? There are some commentary commentators who say that he figured it out. He knew they were angels or maybe he thought that they were messengers of a king. 
But according to the rabbis of the Talmud, Abraham thought that these were Arabian idol worshippers, not dignitaries, not people who recognize God. And yet look at the way in which he, in his moment of weakness and sickness, extended to them hospitality. And what we really see here is an appreciation of human dignity, that every human being is created in the image of God and is deserving of honor. And this is why Abraham treats those whom he considers to be human beings in such a wonderful way. And uh, there are really three practical applications uh, which I want to draw out uh, based on our tradition for the way in which Abraham treats his guests. And we can bring this into our own lives. Um, not only when we're treating guests, but when we're treating people, engaging with people in general. One is to have the sensitivity to people's feelings. When we're trying to help someone, it's not just a matter of doing something for them physically, carrying something for them, preparing a meal, showing them something. It's done with a sense of sensitivity. And this is particularly true, although not only true, when it comes to visiting those who are unwell. In Hebrew, the term for visiting the sick is bikur cholim. Bikur cholim. Cholim means sick people. Bikur doesn't simply mean to visit, but in other contexts, it has the connotation of investigating something, inquiring. And that's what we do when we visit someone who's sick. We're not necessarily through explicit questions, but through listening to them, being attuned to their needs, working out what does this person need. Maybe they feel afraid. Maybe they have a sense of isolation. Maybe they're insecure. What does this person need at the moment and how can I help them? And this is true when we visit those who are sick. It's also true when we talk to people who have sadly been bereaved. Someone's lost, God forbid, a relative in the last few days or the last few weeks or the last few months. And it's also important to be in touch with people even months after someone has passed on. Getting a sense, what does that person really need? How does that person feel? And what and, and, and think about the time of the year, because different times of the year can be challenging in different ways for people who have been bereaved. And I want to mention this specifically as we start to come, believe it or not, towards the holiday of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a time where the family gets together, whether it's a husband and a wife, a father and a, and a daughter, sometimes siblings. Families are often together on Hanukkah, and Hanukkah can be a very sad time and a difficult time for people who are no longer with certain members of their family. And that's an important thing for us all to be aware of as we come towards this holiday. Maybe there's somebody who would appreciate a call from us and, and know that we're thinking of them. And how do we have sensitivity and try and get a sense of what people are really going through? There was a rabbi, Chacham Rabbi Solomon Mustafi, who lived in, in Jerusalem in the 1970s, a Sephardi rabbi. And this Chacham Mustafi was particular to always go and visit a rabbi, um, someone who was uh, homebound. And he would go to visit this rabbi in his home after shul on Friday night, every week. And someone once said, this rabbi who you go to visit, he's in the home the whole time. He can't leave. So you could go to visit him any time of the week. Why do you specifically go on Friday night? Friday night, your family is waiting for you. They want to have a Shabbos meal. And you're off every, specifically at that time visiting this person. And Chacha Mustafi answered in a way which I think is very instructive for us in terms of the kind of thought and sensitivity that we need to have. He answered that there must be that the saddest time of the week for this rabbi who I go to visit must be Friday night. Because I remember when this rabbi used to walk home from shul on Friday night, he was the rabbi of the shul and people would walk with him and he'd talk with them about a problem in the parasha or they'd ask the rabbi to give a blessing to their child. This rabbi wouldn't have that opportunity on Wednesday night. He didn't have it on Thursday night, but Friday night was a time when people would be interested in seeing him when he had time for that kind of interaction, that special interaction with his congregants. And that's why I go on Friday night, because Friday night must be the time when he misses those occasions, those interactions. And what you see from Chacham Mustafi's sensitivity is that it's not just a mitzvah to be there for people. It's a mitzvah to be there for people when it counts. 
We need to think about what's the right time. What are the times when it will really mean something to be there for such a person? And that's one message that we take away from this, uh, from this story of Abraham and the three angels. The second one is that when we're doing a favor for someone else, don't glory glorify yourself about your kindness. Don't talk about how much work you're doing, how hard it is. Look at what I'm doing for you. We find with Abraham and the three angels that Abraham made it appear as if they were giving him the privilege. He says to them when he asks them to stay and have something to eat and drink, my Lord, if I find favor in your eyes, please stay. He made it out that they were doing him a favor by giving him this opportunity. And that's also very important for us when we're doing things for people. It's very easy to do it in a way which belabors the point of how much we're doing for them and realize what I'm giving up for you and realize what I'm doing and look what I'm doing. We should try and switch that around, make the person feel comfortable, make them feel that they're actually doing us a favor by giving us the opportunity. And the third takeaway is that even that sometimes when we're helping people, we do so in a way which is actually a bit inconvenient for them. We tell our, say to ourselves, well, you know, I'm doing a favor for them. So I'll do it in whatever way I want. And sometimes the way we do a favor can actually cause a lot of inconvenience. And one of the great commentaries, the Radak, points out that Abraham is an exemplar for us, that when we're doing an act of kindness, we shouldn't create difficulty for the recipient. Because it talks again and again, I think five times in the Torah's account this week, about how Abraham hurried and ran to prepare the food. Because he saw these passers by and it seemed to him that they were in a hurry. So rather than simply saying, come, have some food and drink, and then schlepping it and taking a long time and saying, well, you know what? I'm doing a favor for them. I'll do it at my pace. No, Abraham said, you know what? I want these people to enjoy the food, the drink, the hospitality, but I also don't want to delay them on their journey. I can see they're in a hurry. And so Abraham ran in order to prepare these, these items for them. And that's a message for us as well. Don't simply do a favor for someone else. Do it in a way which will cause them the minimum of trouble. I want to uh, um, mention another dimension of the kindness that's happening over here. We mentioned uh, before Bikr Cholim visiting the sick. Uh, Abraham doesn't visit the sick in this week's parsha, but what we do see is that Hashem visits Abraham. And the rabbis from the Talmud actually use this week's parsha as a proof text for the idea that Hashem visits the sick. The rabbis say that we see from the Torah that Hashem clothes the naked because after Adam and Eve sin and they realize that they're naked, they're embarrassed, Hashem makes them clothes. So say the rabbis also, that Hashem comforts the mourners, because Hashem blesses Isaac after Abraham dies. And Hashem buries the dead, because Hashem buried Moshe, he buried Moses. And say the rabbis, Hashem visits the sick. And their proof text is this week's parsha, that Abraham, just after having received his bris, his circumcision, is sick, he is sitting at the, in the heat of the day, and, Hashem, and the, the Torah, the parasha, begins by saying that Hashem appeared to him. And so we see that when we do these kind of activities, like visiting the sick, not to mention giving people clothes who otherwise don't have, and comforting those who are mourning, and participating in a funeral, a burial, when we do these things, we are walking in the paths of God. And uh, the beautiful story is told of a rabbi, a very formidable stern rabbi called Rabbi Yecheskel Abramsky, who was once walking after a, a Torah class that he gave with all his students talking about the intricacies of a Talmudic passage. And he noted, noticed that there was a little girl who was sitting on a small wall and she was crying. And he stopped in the middle of his discussion with his students and he said to her, why are you crying? And the little girl said, I'm crying because my friends said that they don't like my dress. And Rabbi Abramsky said, what's your name? And she said, my name is Shoshana. Shoshana, he said, go and tell your friends that Rabbi Abramsky says that you have a very lovely name and you have a very lovely dress. And the girl stopped crying and with a big smile on her face 
skip to her friends to you to tell them what the rabbi just said to her. The students were confounded. Rabbi, is this befitting of someone of your stature to be in, engaged in such a conversation about pretty dresses and pretty names? And Rabbi Abramsky quoted the verse from Isaiah, which said that God wipes tears from faces. God wipes tears from faces. And so Tunley said, now I have the opportunity to, so to speak, wipe tears from the face of this girl. I am walking in the path of God. When we do our acts of kindness, may we know that not only are we walking in the path of Abraham, but also we're working, walking in the path of Hashem. I want to wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom to Nancy, to Lillian, to Steve, to Diane, and the Shavuot Tov to everyone watching next week. Uh, and wishing everyone a blessed day, a wonderful Shabbos, and a great week ahead.